A very good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us from all parts of the world. And we are truly, truly happy to have you month after month. And uh, to begin with, I would like to thank our wonderful team, Alejandra, John, Rima, for organizing these grand rounds on behalf of IUSG. And of course, all our members who have been participating in a big way. So you will all be very happy to know two things I wanted to say before we start. One, Alejandra and John and all of us are compiling a book on whatever the grand rounds are, which is going to be very unique because it's going to be practical tips from the experts and not really a theoretical knowledge. So we should look forward to it. Honestly, I'm looking forward to it myself and uh, I'm sure all of you would enjoy reading the book. And the second announcement is about Enflip March 2024, which will be held in November 20 to 21st in Singapore, SNEC. And this will be a pre-conference meeting to Asia Pacific uh, Vitoretna Society meeting. So it's going to be about a very ambitious project of MUV, uh, which is like we are very sensitive to the availability of technology in different parts of the globe. So instead of doing everything by for every patient, we are trying to rationalize the use of imaging and minimizing. First day will be a basic course in imaging, and the second course will be uh, the report, the nominal group techniques, which our teams have been working for more than a year now. So we will have IUSG, all the top notch in full force. So please join us for Inflamacho. Registration is open in case you are not registered. With this, I will pass on the baton to John Campen. And John, thank you so much for what you have been doing. Thank you, Vishali. So um, welcome, everyone. This is the seventh installment of our UVITIS um, Grand Rounds, so an initiative of the International UVITIS Study Group to sort of provide case-based learning about UVITIS. Uh, we know that not all the parts of the world even have UVITIS developed as a specialty. And um, so this is sort of part of a a way that our society is trying to share our knowledge um, with the rest of the world. And these have been really great sessions. Um, today, we're talking about ocular tuberculosis, which is something that during my career, um, we've begun to think totally differently about um, than we did before. And um, thank you to um, Rima Bansal for um, organizing this session. And Rima is going to MC the session. So thank you, John. Uh, a very welcome uh, to this uh, special session of ocular tuberculosis. And uh, as you can see, we have all the uh, stalwarts of ocular TB in this webinar. To begin with, uh, we have uh, Dr. Vishali, who will be giving the uh, thematic lecture on practical tips in the management of ocular tuberculosis. Uh, we all know her as the president of uh, IUST. Not only that, she's the uh, Immediate past presidents of Uveitis Society of India and currently the vice president of Vitro Retinal Society of India and of course the chief of Retina and Uveitis Division of Advanced Eye Center PGI. That's our hospital. So over to you, Dr. Vishali, for practical tips on, in the management of ocular tuberculosis. Thank you very much, uh, Reema, for the very kind introduction. So I will talk about the, this is a topic given to me by Alejandra, practical tips in the management of ocular tumor. So the learning objectives for today's talk would be, first, recognition of clinical signs, like how do we characterize the phenotype for TB? Second, the labs, understanding the pretest probability and putting the positive labs in very right context. Third, when to treat. And fourth, what if patient is not responsive to therapy? So let's go on to the first step, which is first 
when we look at the patient of uveitis, we recognize the phenotype because recognition of the phenotype is the key in making the diagnosis of TB. Everything else comes later. If the phenotype is not suggestive of TB, the labs or any other testing has absolutely no meaning because that patient is probably not, in all probability, not ocular TB. So there are some very well-defined uh, phenotypes, which whenever we look, we think of ocular TB. And granulomatous anterior uveitis tops the list. When we see these mutton fat keratic precipitates, we see the nodules on the surface of the iris, which are Bissaka's nodule, our copious nodules like here on the iris border. And we have a broad-based posterior synechae. These are the situations where we typically think of either TB or sarcoid. The presence of these broad-based synechae are actually more in favor of tuberculosis than sarcoidosis. In the fundus, this is the one which is actually more commonly involved in TB than the interior segment. So we may have a small tubercle. We may have a large tuberculomas, which may look like an abscess and very commonly confused with metastasis, ocular tumors, amelanotic melanoma, even fungal granuloma, and you know any other mass lesions in the eye. There could be retinal vasculitis and there could be serpiginous like coronitis. So first is we have to understand the imaging biomarkers and learn about the clinical clues which will point us towards the direction of ocular TB. So let's look at the granulomas. So when we look at the granuloma, for example, this large yellow mass, the first important thing is to determine whether this granuloma is located in the retina or choroid. Because any lesion which is primarily involving the retina is probably not TB. So don't think of TB as an etiology of the lesion which is primarily in the retina because TB comes through hematogenous spread. So it involves the choroid first and the retina gets involved secondarily and is not primarily involved. However, there would be exceptions, but we are not talking of exceptions today. So this is an example, a typically a TB granuloma would look like. We have a large, single, yellowish mass. There would be involvement of the retina as is indicated by the arrowhead overlying retina, only the outer retina. And TB granulomas have been beautifully shown to be VEGF dependent. So they grow in presence of VEGF. So if you are seeing some retinal hemorrhages, retinal angiomatous proliferins on top of the granuloma, it's a very important biomarker that probably what you are dealing with is tuberculosis. And this is what I was talking about, the vascularity in the granuloma. The arrows indicate these vessels, the tangled blood vessels. You can see them on angiogram. But honestly, you really do not need either an angiogram or ICG to show you because they are so obvious clinically. So if you see a granuloma with the vascularity, it is more likely to be tuberculosis than metastasis or fungus or anything that you might be considering in the differential. A very important phenotype that was described by our group is serpiginous like coroditis. And this happened in 2003. And attributing TB as an etiology of serpiginous coroditis made a major difference. Because before that, whenever we would see serpiginous coroditis, we will assume it to be autoimmune in nature. And we would always treat it with immunosuppression. And before 2003, it might sound a kind of strange to you, but we were not even testing them for tuberculosis because we always believed that they were autoimmune in nature. And this is the paper uh, which we published uh, before 2003. And you can see that we were having a very high rate of recurrence. 
more than 95% of patients were having recurrences, though some of them were receiving double or even triple immunosuppression. So why was it? That was because we were not even looking for TB as an etiology. And the moment we started looking for it and treating for it, the recurrence rate dropped down from more than 95% to, you know, 10%. So that is was the significant, uh, you know, addition to the literature. And this paper appeared in ophthalmology in 2003, and it was just seven patients at that time we reported. But following that, Rima worked on it. And in 2012, we went back to the same journal with 105 patients, and the recurrence rate by the addition of TB was just 9.7% compared to more than 95% if you were not adding something as easily available and simple thing like anti-TB treatment. So this is the phenotype, which is very, very characteristic. And if you see this phenotype, these are the patients who need to be tested for TB and treated for TB. Now, this is the classical serpiginous described by Dr. Don Gass, which when you look, you absolutely think of an autoimmune disease. So how can you distinguish the classic from serpiginous-like? Because sometimes they resemble so much each other that you can't really differentiate one from the other. So here is the classic serpiginous, and this is TB. TB serpiginous tends to be unilateral. It may have associated inflammation in the vitreous or interior chamber, usually begins in the posterior pole. And very importantly, it's multifocal, and you will have pigment clumping in the center. Whereas in classic serpiginous, it's not multifocal. And I can go back a slide and show you this is classic. It's unifocal. It has pseudopodia-like projection, and the end of the pseudopodia are active. This is very different from TB, which is multifocal. However, when they scar, they both look so similar that you can get confused. But even if there is a confusion, please test for TB. Moving on to the next phenotype, which is retinal vasculitis. Uh, as I pointed out, TB does not cause retinitis per se, except two case reports. But vasculitis with chorea retinitis, and especially if you see occlusive vasculitis, this is TB. We strongly recommend discontinuation of the term Eels disease because Eels, by definition, is idiopathic. And if you are attributing TB as an etiology, it is TB vasculitis and should not be termed as Eels disease. A simple clue. If you look at a patient of vasculitis like this, just get an autofluorescence done. If the autofluorescence shows these dark lesions, involvement of RPE, think about TB. Because vasculitis due to bitches, due to... GPAs and other things generally does not have the involvement of the RPE. So RPE involvement on a non-invasive test like autofluorescence is a very important biomarker that what you're dealing with is probably TB. It tends to be occlusive in nature. The fluorescence will show you all the areas of capillary non-perfusion. As you can see, New vessels typically develop at the junction of the profused and non-profused retina. They tend to bleed. So many years ago, when we were not testing them for TB, we used to call it idiopathic recurrent hemorrhages, and that is what the Eels disease was. This is how the left eye looks like. You can see there is choroidal involvement, and especially if you are seeing the choroiditis patches, which are located along the blood vessels, like this. They are very important, the arrowheads. They indicate the paravascular patches of choroiditis. If you see them, it's more likely to be TB than any other etiology. These are just imaging biomarkers, not 100%, but these are the ones which will lead towards positive etiology. 
Now, what these patches actually are, they appear like vasculitis. But if you see ICG, this is the point from where they are entering from the choroid. So when there is an active vascular inflammation, you don't see underlying choroiditis. But when the lesion is healed, they appear as patches like this, which are along the blood vessels. Now, this is an example when you do not think of TB. For example, this is a 74-year-old man who complains of blurred vision, floaters. You have done the fluorescein, uh, not fluorescence, sorry, autofluorescence. You are not seeing much out there. You do fluorescein. There is NBD, there is non-occlusive vasculitis, and there is this leakage. This is something you would think of sarcoidosis and not tuberculosis. Just to give you an example, that even if the test for these, this particular patient is positive, but the phenotype is not suggestive of TB, you do not have to add ADT to it. So this is the same patient of sarcoidosis on two years follow-up on methotrexate. So the second thing comes, when do you test for it? I think this is a very important, and Soumya has a beautiful talk on this about knowing the pre-test probability. So what is a pre-test probability? Pre-test probability is the likelihood or the probability of a specific condition being present in an individual before you do any diagnostic test. So based on the individual's clinical presentation, risk factor and the prevalence of condition in the population, you will judge whether that test needs to be done. And if a positive test comes, when it is likely to be more true positive. So if you know the pre-test probability of the test that you are doing, it leads to high positive predictive value. For example, if you have a typical patient, which is HLA B27 fibrinous anterior uveitis, the pre-test probability of that patient being TB is very low. So please do not even get the TB test done because it will end up confusing everybody. I'll show you example. This example on the left is actually a case of fibrinous CSC. Now, patient with CSC doesn't need to be tested for TB. However, this patient did get tested for TB got TB positive and was treated with anti-TB and steroid that resulted a worsening in CAC. Whereas on this is a young researcher working in a premier institute in the country on mycobacterium TB lab. However, she was not tested for TB. She was diagnosed as macular serpiginous choroiditis and given immunosuppressive treatment along with steroid, which resulted in a lot of worsening. This is what she ended up with, a large abscess-like lesion, and she lost her vision because we did not look at the pre-test probability of TB being higher and treating her and adding specific therapy. So this is what I love, this editorial on hyposkelia. So hyposkelia is, you know, we are so much dependent on technology that we are losing kind of our skills. So clinical clues are still very important. Do not overdiagnose TB, do not overtreat, and do not just blame your test, including modules, EGRA, or even COTS group guidelines for hyposkelia. The second is how to diagnose TB. I think I have to move a bit faster. So how to diagnose TB? There are basically three tests. Montus, in duration of 10 millimeter or more after 72 hours, quantiferon TB cold, and CCT chest. When we do CCT chest, we are looking at old exposure to TB, old GONS focus, some calcified nodes, and more than 90% of the patients who have active ocular disease will not have active pulmonary disease. And that needs to be known both to us as well as to the internist who's coordinating with us. PCR from ocular fluid, every center has a different protocol, but it is not standardized so far. 
The bottom line is before you label it as TB, rule out all other possible etiologies. Then we come to when do we treat? Well, treatment for pulmonary TB, you know, came in 1905, and this is the Robert Koch coming out when he received his, you know, ovation, when he received his uh, Nobel Prize for NTTB, and it took us almost more than 100 years to start treating ocular TB. So still we did not have any guidelines when we would treat, and all over uh, the uveitis experts were facing a problem because there was no consensus amongst the uveitis specialist. So that's how four of us, we started collaborative ocular TB study group. This was the first meeting during IOIS. And when we started collecting the data, we realized there were a lot of global variation and challenges in the management of TB. But we also realized that everyone in every part of the world was seeing TB and it was not really restricted to, you know, few populations. However, the incidence was high in the migrants in many of the countries. I will not go into the court's publication. You can assess them anytime. But what the important point was no evidence of systemic TB in more than 90%. Most common phenotype was serpiginous like choroiditis. Montius was positive in 87, TB gold in 89, and these two were most commonly performed tests. PCR was not commonly performed or trusted. Chest CT was better than X-ray for detecting old exposure. You know, almost 69% compared to 26% for the X-ray. So we did establish the guidelines further how the experts agreed to treat TB. We took into consideration different phenotypes. The area from which the patient came, endemic or non-endemic, was it the first or the recurrent episodes? And we just took permutations and combinations of three readily available tests, which is PPD, quantiferon TB gold, and chest imaging. So there was Delphi and it was a complex, you know, analysis. I don't even want to get into it, uh, but all these are available and both the reports of the consensus are published in uh, ophthalmology again. But I will just summarize it for you. Serpiginous like choroiditis, the, uh, the consensus was that this is the phenotype which was so very typical for TB that you will treat if both immunology and radiology is positive, if both immunology were positive, if one immunological test, one radiology positive, or the you know experts felt that even if only one immunological test is positive, it is worth treating. Anterior uveitis, however, was not really a very well represented a phenotype of TB, so you would treat only if the disease is recurrent and don't jump on to add ATT in the first episode. This is a very common situation that we have done with me for so-called Eels disease and there is inactive vasculitis. There is no need to treat this. Vasculitis is to be treated only if it is active. To make things simpler, we have COTS Calculator, and COTS Calculator is available on our website as well as the publication in the journal I, where you simply add your patient's name, ID, gender, country. The moment you add country, it will allot endemicity based on WHO criteria. You enter your phenotype and these three tests, tuberculin, interferon, and it says chest x-ray, but in reality, we mean radiologic image. So once you have added this, within, uh, I think it takes 14 seconds uh, for the calculator to give you an inference that there is very high probability amongst the expert, more than 90% to consider initiating anti-TB treatment. So you can download this app, and it will be very useful in making up your mind whenever in confusion. 
So my last leg, I will take two, three more minutes. And sorry, Alejandra, I think I'm exceeding my time. So I'll rush through this. If TB uveitis is unresponsive to treatment, what next? First, you have to keep in mind that there are certain phenotypes which will be which are likely to be unresponsive, and that includes anterior uveitis and intermediate uveitis. So probably what you are treating does not require ATT because these phenotypes we are still not very sure would be due to TB. The second is your diagnosis may be wrong. There are TB masquerades, which we can cover some other time, and you can. Only point which I want to touch, I will not get into reinfections and persistent TB, but I just want to talk about paradoxical worsening. This is just how I showed you, patient of CSR being treated as TB, you stop all the treatment, patient is fine. Now, paradoxical worsening, this is an example of a case. Baseline necra positive, PPD skin test positive, diagnosed PBSLC. And the paradoxical worsening typically appears in two to three weeks after starting the therapy. And you can see the new lesions appearing. There is no need to panic. If you're very sure it's TB and it's not so or something else. I mean, you've got to be very sure about your diagnosis, but if you are sure about your diagnosis, there is no need to panic. And this needs the addition of either steroids, which can be local, which can be, uh, you know, systemic, intravitreal methotrexate, and even um, oral corticosteroids or intravenous corticosteroids in case of juxtaphobial lesions. Um, intravitreal adalubimab <clears throat> only in very extreme cases. And this is just an example. I, I'm not getting into all this, but I just want to bring up this topic of paradoxical worsening. And I think Sudarshan has a case and we can discuss it. You can keep in mind mycobacterium atypical. There could be reinfection if there is. We can take it up during the discussion towards the end. And drug resistance is not so common, so I will not, uh, you know, really go on there. And lastly, one word about host-directed therapies. Uh, all along our lives, we have been busy in killing the microbe, but it's also important to look at the host. And the latest attention, our review beautifully written by Ivan in progress in I, retinal and eye research is all about host-directed therapies. We can again take it up during this. And this is an example of adding VEGF and moxiflox to treat very large TB granulomas. It really helps. So to conclude, recognize the phenotype, put labs in right perspective, treat only if there is an evidence to treat. You don't have to treat the entire uveitis population simply because the Montes is positive. Non-response to TB could be due to multiple causes, so don't jump on to drug resistance straight away. I think we can have a talk on this separately or we can take it up in q and Thank you so much once again, and thank you, IUSG, for giving me the opportunity. So thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful lecture on the practical tips. It's not easy um, to cover this huge, vast topic in such a short time and i'm sure we'll have lots of points for discussion at the end so with this now we move on to the case presentations which is the second part of the webinar and uh, we have three cases which will be presented by the fellows and their mentors will be the discussions for their respective cases so the first case is on tb serpiginous lycoroditis and for this we have dr ahana singh who will be presenting this case and um, the mentor and her mentor is Dr. Sudarshan, who is a senior consultant in uh, division of uh, uveitis and ocular immunology in Shantra Nitrale, Chennai, India. So over to you, Dr. Ahana. And with this, we will uh, follow with Dr. Sudarshan as the discussion for this case. Are my uh, slides visible? 
Yes, they are visible. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank IUSG and my mentor, Dr. Sudarshan Sir, for giving me this opportunity. So, I will be presenting serpiginous neck choroiditis, a case series. So, the first case was a 17-year-old female who had come with diminution of vision since two weeks in her right eye and similar complaints in her left eye since four days. She had been started on oral prednisolone elsewhere and at presentation, she was on a dose of 30 mg per day. There was no history of TB or TB contact. So we can see active choroidal lesions at the posterior pole in both the eyes. Her mantle was positive, quantified on TB gold was positive, and she was started on anti-tubercular regimen in view of bilateral involvement of the posterior pole. Intravenous methylprednisolone three doses were given, followed by tapering dose of oral prednisolone according to her body weight. So at one month's follow-up, clinically the lesions seemed to have healed completely and FAF showed resolving lesions in the right eye. So there was no further inflammatory activity and this held true even after five years where her vision was 6-6 and 6 in both the eyes. The second case was a 22-year-old female who had been treated for both eyes, serpiginous uh, like choroiditis with oral prednisolone elsewhere and the lesions had uh, resolved completely. There was no history of TB or TB contact. Her mantle was negative, QTB was positive, HRCT chest was normal, VDRL TPHA was negative. So the first image shows the inactive choroidal lesions in the periphery. After eight months, however, there was a recurrence of inflammation in both the eyes. So this time ATT was started along with oral corticosteroids. So uh, this led to resolution of the lesions and after nine months, we can see that there was no further inflammatory activity and uh, during this time her ATT course had also been completed. However, one month following this she had blinding of vision in her right eye. So OCT was done and it revealed cystoid macular edema in both the eyes. This time she was started on mycophenol at Mofetil 1 gram twice a day along with oral prednisolone 40 mg per day with weekly slow tapering. Again, the cystoid macular edema resolved and there was no further inflammatory activity and after one year, her vision was 6N6 in both the eyes and her last visit six months later, there was no uh, recurrent inflammatory activity. The third case was a 36-year-old male who had come with complaints of diminution of vision in his left eye since one week. So we can clearly see the choroidal lesions at the posterior pole along with disc edema. So the same picture was seen on FFA where we can see a hot disc and choroidal lesions uh, giving a ring of fire appearance in the later phases of the angiogram. So RPR, TPHA, Manto test, Toxoplasma antibodies all came out to be negative. The patient was started on oral corticosteroids along with calcium supplements and antacids and he was asked to follow up after one month. So after one month, his vision had improved. There were healed lesions or resolving uh, lesions uh, seen, but at the same time, along the superior arcade, new choroidal lesions were seen. So this time, his QTB was negative. HRCT showed all granulomatous sequelae. So ATT was started, and the oral corticosteroids was again hiked up to the original dose of 60 mg per day. One month later, his vision had decreased to 6-18 N-18. So we can see that the previous lesions had resolved. However, there were new and resolving lesions seen both at the posterior pole and in the mid-periphery. So this was diagnosed as a case of paradoxical reaction to ATT. He was started on intravenous methylprednisolone, given three doses. So post-IVMP, his near vision had improved and the lesions seemed to be resolving. So he was started on mycophenol at Mufetil, one gram twice a day with oral corticosteroids. ATT was continued and the patient was asked to follow up after one month. So after one month, there was no uh, new fresh lesions seen and the inflammation was under control. So to summarize, in the first case, the female who had presented with serpiginous like choroiditis in both the eyes was treated with oral prednisolone and ATT in the first visit. This led to resolution of inflammation and there was no further recurrence even after five years. The second case, the inflammation was initially treated with oral prednisolone. However, there was recurrence seen in both eyes. This time, ATT was given along with oral prednisolone. Uh, later on, there was again recurrent inflammation in the form of cystoid macular edema. This time, MMF along with oral prednisolone was given. In the third case, the initial inflammation was treated with oral prednisolone. 
uh, even though the, the inflammation resolved, there were there were signs of new inflammation. So this time ATT was added. The inflammation was still not under control. So this time ATT, IVMP, oral prednisolone, and mycophenolate mofetil was given. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Anna, for this uh, wonderful series of cases. And with this, now I invite uh, Dr. Sudarshan uh, as the discussant. And Dr. Sudarshan is the uh, is a senior consultant in Shankara Netralya Chennai in the VITS and Ocular Immunology Division. He's also the secretary of UVITS Society of India. Over to you, Dr. Sudarshan. Thanks, Rima. Um, uh, we were actually confused about the which case to present because sub is like already seem to be presenting different course in every other way. So, so let's uh, see how it uh, how it uh, bails out each of them. So, Dr. Vishali just uh, told us how each of the ocular phenotypes can be tuberculosis. Uh, we know that uh, the posterior vitic conditions like subretinal lapses, granuloma, sub is like coriditis, or the retinal vasculitis where you have a CRI adjacent vessel or these subvascular glaucoma uh, granulomas can be tuberculosis. When you look at the surprisingly like coriditis, we, we know from the past that uh, we used to call these placoid discrete lesions as APMPP and then now some of them used to be coalescing and some of them partly coalescing and not coalescing at all. So these were called ampigenous and even uh, we many of us have publications named after ampigenous. So and then like the Classical ones where it started off from the disc, classical uh, serpigenous or the GHPC was known to be autoimmune, very papillary. But the ones which did not start from the disc or starting from the mid periphery or the posterior pole, then uh, associated with the traitors or vasculitis, probably is tuberculosis. So, so I don't know, probably this APMPP, ampigenous and serpigenous is probably a spectrum where uh, initially it starts as ampigenous and then coalesce uh, later on to become a serpigenous like. So coming back to our case, so the most common posterior vitic condition in the cause consensus is what the serpigenous like correlated is. So our first case, it was a young girl fitting into the criteria of a characteristic serpigenous like pattern, ancillary tests were supportive. So ATD was started with QFT being positive. So this treated with ATD and steroids and we have not had a recurrence for the past 5-6 years. So we know like it has been a happy ending in the first case. So with this case and the literature, we know that phenotypically, serpigenous like coriditis, you can give more weightage uh, as uh, for the phenotype and it can be tuberculous, especially if you have any of the ancillary tests positive and in endemic areas like India. We don't know the pathogenesis, probably the uh, mycobacterium stays in the RP and coriditis is a, is a reactivation. And ATT is known to control active inflammation and prevent recurrences. So, Rima has a study long time back which showed that approximately two-thirds of the recurrences it reduces ATT when compared to steroids alone. And in our uh, case also, there was no recurrence for the past six years. Steroids alone obviously has a higher risk of progression and development of new lesions like the second one. So, in the second one, this was treated uh, uh, elsewhere uh, when the patient came to us, had scarring here and there and had a history of multiple recurrences was treated with multiple types of steroids, oral, topical, local, subtenons. And uh, when she came to us, she uh, had newer choroidal lesions close to the fovea and with vision loss. So at this time, and to quantify one, we had repeated and it came out to be positive and treated with ATD and uh, it healed. There is no recurrence of choroiditis. So, but then Ahana showed us that uh, there is no recurrence of choroiditis during the follow-up. But then uh, after the ATD course was completed, the patient came back with vitreous inflammation and cystoid macular edema. So it's not necessary that every time you'll have to follow up for the coriditis alone, it probably can come back this way. So this was treated with steroids and topical on steroids and IMTs was added at this point and if you can call it, then it went into remission. So it's not necessary always, as I said, that serpigenous like coriditis can come back as coriditis alone, but then if it comes back, then you can come back in the other eye like this, where this patient was treated uh, the right eye with uh, steroids and ATT, but then uh, left eye initially was normal, came back after the course of ATT with recurrence. This At this point, after the course of ATT, we started uh, immunosuppressors and then this healed. So why does TB uveitis recur at all? So it's probably that the MTB hides in the retinal pigment epithelium and uh, 
triggers and T cell mediated immune response. The inflammatory response can be to the live or the replicating mycobacterium tuberculosis or to the immune mediated response to non viable components. So, the autoreactive T cells or activated TH17 cells, Somia and our centers have been studying on it, are known to be culprits for the same. So, we need to answer some frequently asked questions in Sopitan Select Coriditis. So, we would like to know whether the ATT prevents or reduce or reduces the chances of recurrence. So, the answer is that it may not prevent it in all cases. As in the first case, it prevented and in the second case, it reduces the chances of re recurrence or reactivation. So, it needn't necessarily always be a reactivation in the form of serpigenous like coriditis. It can be in the form of vitreitis or a macular edema. But then how else we treat if the reactivation occurs? Yeah, obviously, you hike up the anti-inflammatory therapy. Local steroid injections like Ozodex are good alternatives. And uh, biologicals, as Dr. Vishali was mentioning about adalimumab being used in specific situations only in relentless varieties. But then in India, obviously, we'll have to be worried about risk of TB and other uh, infections in the endemic settings. So, but not always is it such a, such a smooth ride. It doesn't end off with that. So, sometimes it doesn't, it's not that it comes back after the course. It can come back within the course of the treatment itself. This is the third case which she showed. A patient with uh, parietal lesions like this, man to negative, chest x-ray was negative, treated with steroids only. But we know now by now that steroids alone, the recurrence is high and it's expected to come back. So, we know all, we also know that serpigenous leg coriditis, coriditis, granuloma, or subretinal abscess, even though the ancillary test may be negative, phenotypically you weigh it more towards TB. So, at one month, as expected, it came back. This is almost like multiple coriditis granuloma coalescing in a serpigenous leg pattern. So, in this, interestingly, again, the Manto and Quantiferon was negative. So, Somia, Kalpana, and all have uh, published a series where negative TB immunoreactivity is known and it's possible. And that they seem to behave similar to positive ones. So, you can have serpigenous leg coriditis pattern, very typical, fitting into the correct age group. They can recur and their immunoreactive tests may be negative. So, even the courts have shown that almost 85 to 90 percent of the patients had man 2 quantiferent positivity and about in 10 percent they were negative. So, in this patient, HRCT showed some old Cox kind of lesions. So, based on the recurrence, HRCT findings, we know that if you have a combination of immunological tests, or and the radiological test in either of these forms, then you can definitely treat it with ATT. So that's what we even we did, and it resolved and stable on immunosuppressors. But then this is what happened in between. It worsened despite ATT and steroids. So as we were told, you can have worsening of uh, the coriatal lesions or tubercular lesions despite initiation of treatment. Most important thing is that you don't uh, miss the diagnosis, uh, revisit the diagnosis more. Common is the paradoxical worsening. It's a clinical or radiological worsening of pre existing TB lesions, or it can develop new lesions, as in a patient where the old lesions were improving, but the new lesions started developing at other areas. This can be seen both in immunocompetent and immunocompromised individuals. In HIV patients, they are very common. You need to factor in the ART also along with it in HIV positive patients. But here, we at least have that uh, leverage of not thinking about the third component. Sometimes the anti inflammatory therapy may have been tapered very fast, that is one thing you need to keep in mind and drug resistance, obviously you need to differentiate from paradoxical worsening. So, why does it paradoxical worsening happen? So, it is probably a combination of many factors because of delayed hypersensitivity reaction or uh, the decreased suppressor mechanisms or probably an increased response to the mycobacterial antigen by the host immune system. There are some presence of some substances in the mycobacterial cell wall. Similar immune reactivations have been reported in uh, systemic conditions like TB meningitis or pericarditis, where uh, a JH-like mechanism is known and has been treated with steroids. So, Rima have and others have done a study uh, based on uh, ultraviolet field imaging, where you, they found that about 36% of the patients showed paradox in worsening of ocular lesions. But interestingly, the more important thing is about 18% of the patients, almost half of them, had uh, lesions in the peripheral fundus. So, it's very important that you follow up. It is not necessary that you see the posterior pole and uh, decide that, okay, it's everything is healing and there's things are going fine. So, when it is required, you need to hike up the steroids and anti-inflammatory therapy or probably add even immunosuppressors. So, we saw in these three cases that uh, each of them seem to be behaving differently. But how do we know which course, which SLC will take? So, Ankush group have uh, studied the morphology based on the appearance of it and classified it into placoid advanced dendritic or dendritic 
and they found that the placoid serpiginous like coronaries seem to have a poor visual prognosis. The advanced dendritic and dendritic, these seem to be better and ATT may prevent recurrences in this group. Genetic predisposition is one uh, factor we actually number it in every cause probably. So, inflammatory serum cytokine profiling has been done by Anirudh and others. Um, they found, uh, they actually did the baseline and serial levels in uh, of serum cytokines and they found that uh, there has been a rise in pro-inflammatory cytokines in patients with paradoxical worsening and this also correlated that it indicates a higher basilary load. So, you can actually decide about the uh, the course, how the subgenetic like correlatives of that particular patient will take based on how opaque, opaque the lesions are based on the imaging factor, the higher grade of lesions, opacity at baseline, the greater risk of poor therapeutic response and worsening. So, based on this, you can probably decide how this particular lesion will behave and it can decide about your therapeutic intervention. So, it's not that it ends there. Sometimes you can, the case may develop a CNV and you need to de, do an anti vegf treatment. So, Octa may be helpful and there has been studies that have shown it to be very useful. So, to conclude, uh, TB triggers an infection or an immune-mediated condition. It can have both. SLC, serpentinous like coronitis, is the phenotypic variant, probably more in favor of TB. Its uh, ancillary investigations may be complementary, but if it is recurrent, despite ancillary tests being negative, you can still consider starting them on ATT. You can also look at the contact history. If you have a contact history, as uh, um, Dr. Vishali showed about a person who worked in a hospital setup, then if you have a contact history, then that adds weightage. So, ATT full course 9 to 12 months need to be given. Now, you need to be worried about ethambutal being at a higher dose. So, watch out for ethambutal toxicity. May eventually need an immunosuppressive. Most of our patients seem to be getting it uh, on towards the immunosuppressive group, especially in recurrences and local therapy like Ozodex may be helpful. So, always remember paradoxical worsening needs to be followed up and anti-inflammatory therapy needs to be hiked up accordingly. We can have recurrence either as vitreides, macular edema or choroiditis. So, all these risk factors are being studied and need to be followed up. So, I'd like to thank our whole department, our fellows and other colleagues who have helped me in the presentation. And these are the major articles which I have taken liberally. Thanks to Dr. Kempen, Rima, Dr. Vishali and the ISG Grand Rons team. And special thanks to Ahana. And as uh, Rima just said that being a USA secretary, I thought like I should invite you all for the annual UIT Society meeting at Chandigarh. It's going to be a, a really an academic extravaganza from October 4 to 6, 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudarshan, for the wonderful discussion and the wonderful collection of cases. Uh, so with this, uh, we now move on to another very interesting um, subtopic of ocular tuberculosis, uh, retinal vasculitis. And we have, have the case presentation by uh, Dr. Pietro Gentile, who is a fellow of Dr. Luca Cimini from Italy. So we'll have the case presentation on retinal vasculitis. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I will present the case of a uh, 56, uh, sorry, mom. 56 years old Tunisian male who contracted a syphilis infection in 2010 and who was diagnosed with colon cancer in 2021. It came, it came for the first time at our hospital in August 2023, complaining of decreased vision and floaters in his right, right eye for the previous three weeks. He did not report any previous ocular surgery or trauma and no systemic symptoms. The BC wave was 2025 in the right eye, 2020 in the left eye, and there were no signs of inflammation in the anterior part of the eye. The fundus, uh, the fundus examination revealed a bilateral asymmetrical clinical picture more prominent in the right eye, characterized by diffuse retinal hemorrhages, veins perivascular sheathing, and moderate vitreitis only in the right eye. A tire magnification we noticed the presence of probable retinal novascularization inferiorly to the optic disc in the right eye and in the nasal mid peripheral retina in the left eye. So the next step was obviously to perform a fluorescein angiography. Here you can see the images of the fluorescein angiography in the right eye um, that show the presence of active vasculitis, late leakage inferiorly to the right eye confirming the hypothesis of retinal nevascularization 
and diffuse retinal ischemia in the, in the periphery in all sectors. Findings in the left eye were similar. Uh, we have to say that, as you can see in the, in the image in the right, the neovascularization was more prominent in this eye compared to the one of the, the right eye. In the cyanine angiography, angiography did not show any signs of choroidal inflammation. And concerning the OCT, it showed the presence of a subfobal neuroepithelium detachment uh, in the right eye, whereas the left eye was uh, basically normal. So we were dealing with an occlusive venous vasculitis with moderate vitreitis only in the right eye, veins perivascular sheathing and retinal hemorrhages, and complicated by retinal ischemia and retinal neovascles. We decided to conduct an uveitis workup. The routine examination, examinations were normal. The tests for syphilis did not indicate an, an active infection, but only an immunological scar. The patient was HIV negative and presented an indeterminate quantiferum. For this reason, he, uh, we, he underwent a MANTU test, which was positive. The patient underwent a chest CT scan as well, which showed epical nodules that was uh, finding consistent with ill tuberculosis. The mycobacterium analysis in the sputum was negative. And finally, we referred our patient to uh, our infectious disease specialist who rule out active systemic in signs of tuberculosis. So according to our uveitis workup and to COTS classification, the diagnosis was uh, um, presumed tubercular, uh, to tubercu ocular tuberculosis, in particular tubercular retinal vasculitis. We had to decide how to treat the patient and we decided to treat him with, uh, according to our infectious disease specialist, with a complete 12-month um, for drugs anti-tubercular therapy in association with uh, uh, tapering oral steroids. At that time, the eyes followed two different paths. The right eye had a vitreous hemorrhage just a few days before the start of a systemic treatment, which was treated one month later with a vitrectomy in association with phagomulsification and the laser photocoagulation. Unfortunately, the patient uh, the, the eye experienced a recurrence of vitreous hemorrhage in this, this time with a spontaneous resolution. And so in November 2023, we completed the laser photocoagulation. The left eye, on the other hand, did not experience any vitreous hemorrhage. So we treated it with, uh, one, two months later with laser photocoagulation in association with um, a cycle of free intravitreal injections of ranibitumab. This was a situation in December 2023, four months after the start of systemic treatment. The BC way was 2020 in both eyes. Uh, we can see the resolution of the vitreitis in the right eye, the presence of retinal scars due to laser photocoagulation, the almost complete resolution of retinal hemorrhages, and as you can see in the fluorescent angiography, an optimal control of both vasculitis and retinal neovascularizations. The OCT was also normal. However, in January 2024, the patient developed metasteroid diabetes, and uh, one month later, in February, um, mild, a mild vis visual loss in his left eye with increasing on floaters. At that time, the patient was taking isoinazid, rifampicin, and 5 mg per day of oral prednisone. Uh, the visual acuity was 2020 in the right eye, and 2025 in the, in the left eye, and as you can see in the image in the right, there, were, there was a um, moderate vitreitis in this eye. We perform a fluorescein angiography that show in the right eye the absence of active inf inflammation of, uh, of, of, of active vasculitis, whereas the left eye was inflamed with active vasculitis and the recurrence of retinal neovascularization. So we had to decide how to treat the patient. The, uh, the right eye was non, it was not inflamed. The, the left eye was inflamed with vitreitis, vasculitis, and retinal neovascularization. From a systemic point of view, the patient had developed a metasteroid diabetes, which prevented us to use high doses of oral steroids. And what's more, immunosuppressing drugs were not recommended due to uh, the recent history of malignancy. So we decided to treat the patient with a local approach, in particular with a dexamethasone intravitreal implant. 
This was the result one month later, in April 2024, the BCBA was improved uh, and you can see the implant in the vitreous chamber of the left eye. The fluorescein angiography uh, demonstrated uh, a good and acceptable control of both vasculitis and retinal neovascularization in the left eye. Four months later, uh, the patient needed a further um, injection of dexamethasone implant in the, in this left town, in the left, the left eye. The patient now is still on follow up, and if necessary, a feasible approach could be uh, the injection of flocilonone acetonide uh, implant. Thank you very much for your attention. Dima, you are muted, I think. Okay, I will now invite Luca to please uh, discuss this case. Mm. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, so much for the kind invitation. The, mm, the, te uh, the three most important uh, uh, mm, arguments to, to speak uh, in my presentation are terminology, diagnosis, and management of TB retinal vasculitis. As Michali said, COTS has been active since 2015. Uh, and the most important uh, uh, aspect uh, um, to, um, to, to better understanding and manage ocular TB related uveitis is the standardization of nomenclature. Uh, because uh, this aspect uh, allows physicians to uh, communicate precisely and uh, uh, resulting in improving uh, the care of these patients. As, uh, Pietro showed uh, the fluorangiography is very important, especially ultra wide field imaging, showing uh, a better visualization of a periphery, seeing the ischemic areas, and to indicate also the timing of photocoagulation, contraindicated in uh, presence of active vasculitis, avoiding uh, the release of angiogenic factor aggravating uh, neovascularization. The most important uh, points are then in TB retinal vasculitis are involved more often veins than artery, is typical occlusive vasculitis, the importance of fluorangiography, better uh, ultra wide field imaging, and uh, as uh, Vishali said, uh, the, ocula, uh, the ocular immunologist and avoiding hyposchilia to uh, better interpret the correlation between the phenotype and uh, the, uh, the, the, the test, the result of, of the, the diagnostic test. Regarding the management, it's important uh, in general uh, to, uh, the diagnostic approach is uh, different in endemic and non-endemic area. In endemic uh, region, it's very important to uh, correlate uh, the um, the, 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 the clinical uh, phenotype with uh, um, ocular TB, but uh, in non-endemic area, it's important to avoid other infection, and after, it's important also uh, to think at uh, uh, tuberculosis. Um, in conclusion, uh, phenotype is very important, pretest likelihood of ocular tuberculosis and the differentiation between endemic and non-endemic region. As you, uh, we can see in this uh, slide, it's very important that uh, Vishali showed uh, before. In COTS, uh, it's very important to differentiate endemic and non-endemic. And uh, it's uh, important to underline that most, that, uh, most of the studies um, are from uh, endemic country. And uh, in non-endemic uh, area, 
uh, we have to uh, more uh, um, to have more advances to um, because uh, we need uh, um, a lot of uh, information uh, to improve the patient's care. Regarding the use of steroids, as the other uh, speaker uh, uh, said, uh, are important uh, steroids, especially when you, we have a site threatening uh, uh, um, situation in which the vasculitis involved posterior uh, pole is severe, is uh, uh, a lot of hemorrhages uh, with vitritis, uh, if associated also at uh, choroid, uh, uh, choroidal lesion. And in case of uh, paradoxical worsening, and uh, the use of intravitreal desametasone implant is uh, very useful, in, um, especially in situations in which uh, the steroids, systemic steroids, are uh, contraindicated. Regarding the management of uh, TB ret retinal vasculitis, uh, it's important to consider steroids, systemic steroids, and anti-tuberculosis therapy to avoid reactivation photocoagulation for neovessels associated with uh, ischemic um, uh, area. And uh, it's important to consider the timing of early vitrectomy in a situation in which uh, the, um, um, the hemorrhage are uh, uh, recurrent and are uh, uh, often associated with active fi fibrovascular proliferation. The take-home messages uh, only UVIT specialists uh, can, can uh, recognize clinical findings, uh, thinking at uh, tuberculosis, uh, including retinal vasculitis to avoid hyposkilia. And the interdisciplinary approach is very important for, uh, to manage the uh, complex uh, cases of, uh, um, of uh, ocular TB. And the international groups are working hard to improve the quality of the um, of care of these patients. Thank you. So, well, thank you, Luca. That was a wonderful, again, discussion and the case presentation. And uh, I think there was a slight disconnection. Uh, just to um, Dr. Luca is the uh, chief of the ocular immunology unit in the University of Modena in Regomelia, Italy. So, with this, now we move on to the third case presentation, uh, which is on another topic, important topic of ocular tuberculosis, which is uh, tubercular uh, granuloma. And we have the case presentation by Dr. Ronnie Abhishek, who is the fellow of Dr. Soumya Vasu, uh, who is again chief of the LB Prasad Eye Institute uh, UVITIS unit. Over to you, Ronnie. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'll be discussing two interesting case scenarios on recurrent choroidal granulomas. I'm Ronnie, and this session will be moderated by Dr. Soumya Basu. So, our first patient is a 29 year old female who had presented with sudden diminution of vision in the left eye with constant pain for 10 days. Her best character visual acuity in the right eye was 2020, and the fundus examination uh, was uh, unremarkable. While in the left eye, we can see that the best character visual acuity was 2040, and the patient had uh, subretinal nodular uh, lesions which are superior to the disc with optic disc edema and exudative retinal detachment. Fundus fluorescein angiography revealed pinpoint leaks in the early phases with hypofluorescent spot, which had interlational hyperfluorescence in the late phases, suggestive of choroidal involvement. OCT through the lesion showed contact sign with neurosensory detachment and uh, full thickness choroidal elevation. B scan showed choroidal thickening with subtenon fluid, suggestive of scleritis. We requested the patient to get these investigations done where her monto was. 20 millimeters of induration at 48 hours. ESR was elevated to 28 mm in the first hour. Chest X-ray revealed bilateral hierar prominence and VDL and HIV were negative. With an anatomical diagnosis of left eye posterior uveitis with scleritis, 
a morphological diagnosis of left eye nodular scleritis with choroiditis and a etiology of ocular tuberculosis. We started the patient on 4 drug anti tubercular therapy along with oral prednisolone 40 mg weekly taper. 15 days on treatment, we can see that the lesion has completely resolved with minimal SRF with a best corrected visual acuity of 2040. Four months when the patient is still on ATT, she again presented with left eye diminution of vision, where her best corrected visual acuity was 2040, and the fundus examination showed disc edema and with multiple choroidal granulomas at a different location. Right eye also had a uh, choroidal lesion along the inferior temporal arcade. OCT passing through these lesions showed full thickness choroidal involvement along with subretinal hyperreflective material. And, and the fundus fluorescence angiography showed interlational hyperfluorescence in the later phases, suggestive of choroidal involvement, and also a subvascular lesion in the left eye, uh, which was from the earlier episode. At this point, we started the patient on azathioprine as well, while the patient is still on ATT and tapering doses of prednisolone. Within one month, the lesions have completely resolved with a, with a best corrected visual acuity of 2020 and 2025, in respectively. Five and a half years later, the patient again presented with diminution of vision with uh, redness and pain in the right eye. Best corrected visual acuity was 2060. AC showed two plus cells, presence of iris nodules, medium sized KPs, and posterior synechia. And fundus examination showed a dull yellowish subretinal lesion. OCT passing through the lesion showed full thickness choroidal elevation with subretinal hyperreflective material and uh, neurosensory detachment. We got the patient's QTB and TPH done, which were negative. HRCT thorax showed was normal. The, the patient was started on uh, anti tubercular therapy again along with oral prednisolone tapering doses. And within one month, the lesions have completely resolved. And this is a picture three months after completing ATT, and it has been stable. Our second case scenario is a 37 year old male who presented with counting fingers close to face and RAPD grade 2 in the right eye. Fundus examination showed nodular subretinal lesions temporal to the disc, retinal whitening, optic disc edema, and exudative retinal detachment. B scan showed a nodular thickening of the sclerochoroidal coat, which had moderate to high outer reflectivity and inner low reflectivity, and also presence of T sign that is subtenous fluid, suggestive of scleral involvement. His inflammatory markers were within normal limits. No other tests were done for the etiological diagnosis. And the patient was started on IV methyl prednisolone 500 mg BD for 3 days followed by oral prednisolone tapering doses. 10 days post treatment, the vision has improved to counter fingers 2 meters with almost complete resolution of the lesion. And after the oral steroids were tapered within a month, the vision has improved to 2800. Four months later, the patient presented with pain and hazy vision in the right eye for one week and his visual acuity was 2320. Here we can see a new bright yellowish subretinal lesion which has occurred at a different uh, location. This can show a similar nodular sclerotic uh, nodule uh, similar to the first presentation. His ESR was within normal limits. Systemic examination revealed no abnormalities. Monto was negative and chest x-ray was within normal limits. The patient gave a history of TB contact from a neighbor two to three years ago. And so we started the patient on four drug anti tubercular therapy alone without any corticosteroids. Two weeks after treatment, the choroidal lesion has completely resolved with ATT alone. And five months post treatment, this is the picture with no recurrence. Three years later, the patient presented again with uh, decreased vision in the right eye. Visual acuity is 2125. Here we can see a new lesion which has occurred uh, just beside the previous episode. And the patient was again started on ATT monotherapy without any immunosuppression. And two weeks later, we can see that the lesion has completely resolved and there was no recurrence for the next one and a half years. To start with, our first case 
presented with nodular posterior scleritis with choroiditis, which had complete resolution with ATT and corticosteroids. First recurrence happened bilaterally with uh, when the patient is still on ATT four months into it, and there was complete resolution after adding azathioprine. The second recurrence happened five and a half years later with complete resolution with ATT and corticosteroids. Second patient presented with nodular posterior scleritis with choroiditis had complete resolution with corticosteroids. Second recurrence happened four months later, which completely resolu- resolved with ATT alone without any immunosuppression. The third recurrence happened three, year- three years later with complete resolution with ATT alone. Thank you, Rani. I'll now move on to the discussion of the case. We have it on the same PowerPoint presentation. So what were the highlights of the two cases? If we see, there were multiple tissues involved in both the cases. There's history of pain. So whenever we find a history of pain in a suspected choroiditis, we should suspect scleral involvement. And not just the choroid and the sclera, even the outer retina was involved as shown in the uh, contact sign on OCT. And in one of the recurrences uh, of the first case, there was also granulomatous anterior uveitis. So you can see the involvement of multiple tissues in both the cases. The second thing was that in both cases, there was resolution, complete resolution with both ATT as well as corticosteroids. In first case, each time both ATT and steroids were used, while in the second case, initially, the resolution happened with steroids alone, while later it happened with anti-TB therapy alone. I think this is something that we need to uh, uh, take into consideration. The second thing is that there was complete resolution between the recurrences. So this means that even though the lesions continue to recur, it's very unlikely that there was drug resistance in either of the two patients. And if you see the first patient, there was recurrence in the other eye while the patient was still on anti-TB therapy. And the third point is that neither of the patients had any active pulmonary tuberculosis, though the first patient had signs of hilar lymphadenopathy. And the second patient, in fact, had a negative MONTU test also. We should have done a quantiferon at that point of time. But this was... Uh, I think 2017 or so. So our understanding was uh, not as evolved as it is now. So uh, we didn't do the quantiferon at that time. So if you combine the last three points, it seems like in either of the two cases, there was an endogenous reactivation of tubercular infection in the eye itself. Now, why should we think of endogenous reactivation of mycobacteria in an extra pulmonary site? To understand this, uh, okay, so this is a flow chart which uh, Dr. Vishali also pointed out. Let me first cover this, uh, uh, you know, before going on to the endogenous reactivation part. So, anytime there's a recurrent inflammation, the important things that you want to rule out are the drug compliance, the possibility of a non TB etiology, because Almost always, we do not have any microbiological evidence of the infection. Third is drug resistance. But when there is a recurrent drug-susceptible TB, it could either be a reactivation or a reinfection. Typically, reactivation will be occurring early in the course uh, of the disease, whereas reinfection will happen much later. Relapse is basically a combination of the two where there is a reinfection on top of a endogenous reactivation. This entire concept is borrowed from the pulmonary TB literature. Now let's go back to the point on endogenous reactivation at an extra pulmonary site. So there's a very interesting study from Mexico where they looked at the autopsy findings of people who had died without any past history of TB and they looked at different organs including the liver, spleen, kidneys, brain, but not the eye. And in each case, they found mycobacterial DNA in the reticuloendothelial cells of each of these organs. So even without a history of TB in a middle endemic country like Mexico, you can find evidence of mycobacteria in almost every organ. The question is, can there be a tissue in the eye which can potentially 
harbor mycobacteria like the reticuloendothelial cells in these organs. We think there is, and that is the retinal pigment epithelium, which we call as the RP niche. And there is very good clinical evidence for this. Uh, Professor Narsing Rao did a very nice histopathological study back in 2006, where he showed uh, mycobacteria within the retinal pigment epithelium. And there's a very innovative study by Dr. Rima Bansal, who is here with us today, who looked at the subretinal fluid of patients undergoing retinal detachment surgery and again found mycobacterial DNA within the subretinal fluid of these patients. So it seems that the RP can potentially harbor mycobacteria. There have been some very good experimental studies as well, and these have again come from Dr. Rao's lab and from Dr. Nora, who is in Indonesia. And we find in these experiments that the retinal pigment epithelial cells have very good phagocytosis ability, almost as good as the macrophages. But unlike the macrophages, the mycobacteria tend to survive much longer in the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And very recently, again, Dr. Rao's colleagues have reported that the retinal pigment epithelia have a very high tolerance to the redox stress around the, uh, in, in the surrounding tissues, as well as to antibiotics. So these are all the reasons why mycobacteria can persist in the RP for a very long time. Our contention is that it's not just the RP, but there can be potentially other cells as well, especially the choroidal macrophages, which are way more uh, numerous than the RP, which can potentially harbor the mycobacteria in the eye, as well as the perivascular macrophages, which are present around the blood vessels in the retina. So to conclude, in case you find a persistent or a recurrent inflammation, which seems to have been the theme of all the three cases that have been presented today, First thing you need to make sure, are you really dealing with TB? Look back at the clinical pattern recognition, add or repeat any lab tests. In case there is a persistent inflammation, then think of drug resistance. And this can be tested either molecularly, which is more often the case in ocular samples or by conventional bacteriological techniques. Now, if again there is persistent inflammation and you have ruled out a non-TB cause, you have ruled out drug resistance, do consider adding immunosuppression or local corticosteroids. But what we try to highlight here is the possibility of recurrent inflammation after complete resolution, especially when that recurrence has a granulomatous feature. In these cases, we propose that there could be an anatomical niche for mycobacteria in the eye. And these could be in the RP or even at other tissues like the choroid. And these can potentially cause recurrent inflammation even after you have completed anti-TB therapy. Thank you for your attention. So, thank you very much, Dr. Soumya. So uh, with this, we now move on to the discussion of the webinar. And uh, there are a number of there were a number of questions in the question answer section which have been uh, elegantly answered by the speakers. Um, so um, we'll take up some of the questions that we have in our mind. The panelists are also welcome to have their own questions. So some of the questions common that we you know generally face from the attendees and from even among the experts is that uh, do we need to give you know, the recurrences is a major challenge in ocular TB. So, who all give a repeat course of anti TB therapy? And does it make sense because you've given a complete course? And should you or should you not consider, even consider, giving a repeat course of anti TB therapy? Um, I would um, ask Dr. Vishali for this and then move on to the. Eva, I think there have been n number of questions and I have emailed them. And Soumya has already shown it beautifully. So I'm going to share this chart which Soumya showed once again so that, you know, we can talk about it. And I would love Soumya to comment on it after, uh, you know. So let's go over this. 
your patient is unresponsive to TB treatment. The first thing is you look at the time frame. What is the time after initiating the therapy you feel the patient is not responding? If there is worsening which is happening at two to four weeks and you believe it is TB and you have ruled out all other possible differentials, it could be paradoxical worsening. And we have published and other groups have published that generally within two to three weeks, there is an increase in the cytokines and TNF is the one which you know really uh, goes sky high. And these cytokines are to be treated with steroids or immunosuppression. Very important, if you believe it's paradoxical worsening, do not stop anti-TB treatment. Continue with anti-TB treatment. You can either increase your oral steroids because many times in practical life, uh, when we are treating with TB, we do not really give steroids like 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg. Somehow we tend to hold back. That causes paradoxical worsening. But intravitreal steroids, dex implant, I have no financial interest, but that works fantastic in these cases. Now you have increased your steroids and you see whether the patient is responding or not. Patient is responding, you continue with ATT and you slowly taper off your steroids. We have to remember that in 15 to 20% of the cases when we are reducing steroids, there may be recurrence of inflammation. And these are the patients who would require immunosuppression as a therapy. And Ali from Ahmedabad asked me for how long you give immunosuppression. It is to be given for quite a few months. I generally give it for a year and then repeat my ICGs and fluorescein to see how the patient is responding before reducing the immunosuppression. Now, second is when we come to a time frame that we have started ATT and steroids for more than a month and the patient is not really responding. Now, this is the situation which would worry me. We, I would reinvestigate for all alternative etiologies and we have published one patient with lymphoma, you know, we did not recognize because it primarily presented as vasculitis and it was many, many years ago. And we, her tests were positive. We treated her for ATT. She was not really responding the way she should have. So if the patient is not responding, please reinvestigate for all other possible etiologies. You have ruled out everything and you still feel it is TB. This may be a very, very, very few cases where you expect drug resistance because patients with drug resistance do not show response. Or it may be because the ATT that you are giving is not enough and there is a very large granuloma you know, we don't even know the minimum inhibitory concentration of these drugs in the eye. So they would need some form of host-directed therapies like NTVGF and intravitreal moxiflox. And there are a lot many other host-directed therapies which you can refer the review and add it in addition to antimicrobial treatment. The third is, and this is what bothers us all, is you have treated the patient for two years, the patient remains all right, and suddenly after two years, there is a disease, which means the disease has been drug susceptible, it responded, you stop the therapy, and somewhere along the couple of years later, it reappears. And Soumya has beautifully taken this up. There are three possible mechanisms. It could be endogenous reactivation, it could be reactivation, or it could be a immune-mediated response. In my personal experience, if you see recurrence only in the interior chamber, it's more likely to be immune-mediated. If you see recurrence only in the form of appearance of vitreous cells, it's more likely to be immune-mediated and I would just try them with steroids and immunosuppression and probably 
not push ATT. However, if you have the recurrence of those huge granulomas like LBP group so beautifully showed, then it could be either reinfection or endogenous reactivation. At least I do not know how to differentiate. Maybe Soumya will follow me and add a comment. But these are the cases where repeat ATT may be needed. I went very long. Thank you. But I thought this needed to be addressed. Thank you, ma'am. So we now move on to another very important um, aspect of ocular tuberculosis. Uh, so when we uh, see a case of uh, choroidal granuloma, the tubercular granuloma, uh, how do you go about treating? I mean, do you give a cocktail therapy right from the start? I mean, a combination of corticosteroids, anti-tubercular therapy, intravitreal anti -vegif. Do you go stepwise and do you give anti in all the cases? Uh, what is your approach? So I would uh, take up with Dr. Somya for this. Yeah, thanks for this question. Just a quick comment on the previous slide. Uh, you know, the difference between reactivation and reinfection is usually uh, gauged by the duration from the completion of anti-TB therapy. If at least as per pulmonology literature, if it is less than one year, it's thought to be as reactivation. But if it's more than one year, if it, it's thought to be as reinfection. My contention is that for extra pulmonary TB, this should be taken differently. Also for the local therapy, uh, while I do not use intravitreal methotrexate for any other intraocular inflammation, but somehow in serpiginous like choroiditis, it seems it works very well because you are going to get a lot of steroid responders in whom you cannot inject dexamethasone all the time. So methotrexate could be an option. Now, coming back to your question on the, you know, the cocktail versus anti-TB monotherapy, I think the general consensus is that we should be using it with a combination of corticosteroids, and I'm fully with that. Uh, what differs is the population and I, I again I go back to the systemic TB literature and here specifically the TB meningitis literature where it shows that the genetic makeup of the host uh, affects how the patient responds to anti-TB therapy or to a combination of anti-TB therapy and steroids. And I can say this from experience because I have been practicing in Eastern India for almost 14 years. And all the cases where I showed that patient responded to anti-TB therapy alone. And we have published this not only for choroidal tuberculoma, but also for retinal vasculitis. These are all from Eastern India. On the other hand, past four years I have been in Southern India. And here the patients do not respond very well to ATT alone. And I think this would be the case in majority of the world. So uh, you have to take it as per the your population. When I came here and I found that ATT alone is not working very well, I treat by default all my patients with a combination of ATT and corticosteroids. Well, thank you, Dr. So, I mean, one point I would also like to mention, as you uh, talked about in your cases, that you know when we see these patients of choroiditis, uh, I think we should not ignore the complaint of pain in these patients because uh, earlier we were even my experiences we were not paying attention to the pain or probably we never asked for it or the pain is not so obvious that the patient really pays attention to. But if it is there, I think it really points to the scleral involvement. So it could be a variant of posterior scleritis or serpiginous like choroiditis. We need to look into that. But yes, it's, it's an important marker of scleral involvement. So with this now, we move on to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sudarshan for his comments on uh, TB serpiginous like choroiditis. So we, we've had a number of questions in the QA uh, section in the panel. You know, these lesions are peripheral or these lesions are central. Uh, well, we know these lesions are primarily both central as well as peripheral. So paradoxical worsening or reactivation is another challenge. So do you, again, think of more in terms of local ocular therapy when you have these paradoxical worsening? Or do you straight away go for an increase in the systemic therapy? That means whether you really go for steroids, oral, or maybe immunosuppression, or you would prefer to give 
uh, an injection of dexamethasone implant in the eye. So how do you uh, treat these patients? I mean, apart from the cases that you have shown, your general approach. In general, uh, off late we are thinking about the local uh, dexamethasone implants, but like for the past few years, we've always been treating with the, and most of the reactivations, whenever they are close to the posterior pole or uh, threatening the fovea, so IV methylprednisolone uh, would be the first choice for us many times. It's not necessarily that it is always there in the periphery. But after that, we try to hike up the systemic therapy and add immunomodulators uh, depending on which phase it is of the ATT. But then considering that uh, Ozodex seems to be working very well nowadays, then we seem to be slowly tilting towards Ozodex off late. But for the past few years, I've always been in, in favor of hiking up the systemic steroids alone along with immunomodulators. Thank you, Dr. Sudarshan. So, uh, I, have a, I have a, yeah, please. Now, I have a question with the, uh, to Dr. Kempen. Um, so, like we, we are, uh, in HIV, we have something like the unmasking type of uh, immune recovery, uh, UBITs or the paradoxical worsening. So, uh, is there anything related like that with the endogenous uh, reactivation or the other organs being involved? Have there been studies that have shown whether the organ away from the original organ of inflammation, there can be a reactivation? So, that is what is your article on immune recovery or paradoxical, where there has been an inflammation away from the original organ of infection. Something is there related to that in TB? I um, have been sort of out of that for a long time. I think it should be possible um, because the HIV patient would often have much more extensive infection than was thought because they weren't having an immune response and then once you begin to develop an immune response against tb you know or some other um, infectious agent um then i think you should be able to have that at other sites as well um i believe that tb is thought to be one of the more common things to cause a immune recovery inflammatory syndrome and so yeah we should we should stay aware of that i was curious too um if people often see TB uveitis in um, immunodeficient patients like HIV patients, it doesn't seem like I've seen much, but I haven't been in a very high HIV endemic area. Thank you. So you see a lot not of them, really, Suda. Not really, John Bunce. We were actually looking for TB in our HIV patient. At least we did not see much TB in HIV. We see mm. a lot of virus, toxo, but TB is not very common. Mm. Maybe Sudarshan has different experience because from Shankar Netrale, they have published, but in our center, we did not. I mean, definitely considering that the other infections in HIV, TB is relatively less common. And especially pulmonary tuberculosis being the commonest uh, systemic opportunistic infection in HIV, then ocular TB is not as common that way. Okay. But yeah. interestingly, off late, I've been seeing some serpogenes like coronavirus in HIV patients. Yeah, I've been speculating that you need to have a fair amount of immunity to have the ocular TB type patterns that we have and that it's made, you know, I think of it as being more like a posse bacillary kind of phenomenon to use the way that we think about leprosy rather than a um, multi bacillary kind of phenomenon. And so probably you get more multi bacillary kinds of things with chronic immunodeficiency. Can I make a quick comment on Sudarshan's point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, about TB in the other organ and the eye. So, we have reported two cases back in 2010 where once treatment of a cerebral tubercloma caused worsening of the ocular lesion and vice versa, where treatment of the ocular tuberculosis were caused development of a cerebral tubercloma. So, we have seen both of these. So, it, it's, you know, all organs do work in concert. Dr. Biswas has just typed that 4.8% had ocular TB in HIV positive cases in their series. So um, now we go to another very important question um, about the regime of antitubercular therapy. So I'll come to Luca first and then we'll move on to our Indian. Uh, counterparts in ocular TB. Luca, what is your, how do you treat with, what is your regimen of anti-TB therapy, the four drug? Do you give ethambutol for 
the complete nine months, which is the recent. Uh, uh, Actually, we use, we we follow a, a, a for a for drug therapy for uh, one year. A first two month with, with uh, adding uh, etambutol and pirazinamide, and uh, um, uh, the, uh, the whole course with uh, rifampicin and uh, isona isonazid. So two plus seven, you mean? Uh, sorry, uh, two plus ten. Nine to yes, nine to twelve months uh, uh, complete anti TB therapy course. Okay, so we we uh, heard, we saw the reply by Dr. Vishali in the QA section that you know here we also do it for two months with ethambutol and pyrazinamide. That is the co drug and followed by two drugs, INH and rifampicin. So that is to prevent uh, ocular toxicity. Uh, what about uh, Dr. Sudarshan and uh, Dr. Samyam? I'm I'm really uh, honestly scared of ethambutol. Actually, like I, um, we still try to limit ethambutol as less as possible and follow it up very closely during this two to three month period initially, and afterwards change over to the two or three drug uh, regimen. So, I, Dr. Vishali, as she had typed, like uh, we also limit the ethambutol for the first two or three months, and after that maintain it on nothing. Uh, of late, we've been trying on ethambutol sparing therapy, especially with quinolones as alternative for that. Yeah, so we are also four drug for two months, but what we do after two months is quite different from everyone else because we treat only for four months after uh, of maintenance. I know almost everyone will not agree with uh, our plan, but we have had, uh, if you look at the six month versus nine month uh, comparison, it's it's very comparable data. And to my knowledge, Dr. Rathanam at Arvindai Hospital Madurai is the only person who also treats for six months and not for nine months. And she has uh, reasonably good data as well. I think, you know, uh, better studies are required to really compare the six month versus nine month or longer duration of ATT. Uh, how many of uh, you treat with quinolones? Like I just wanted to know that how often is it ethambutol sparing therapy used uh, by Dr. Biswas does. He's writing, I'm using levofloxacin instead of ethambutol. Yeah. So I think. Um, in courts also, we did not go into the duration of the therapy or the drugs because they are so country-specific and you cannot really interfere with the regimen of this. So I think as a group, we should just tell all our colleagues from across the globe to follow their country practices because we don't want to increase the risk of drug resistance anywhere in the world simply because we are recommending something. So they have to figure it out where their infectious disease because we really do not have consensus and we do not know what we are doing is one regimen better than the other. So another uh, important question open to all the panelists. Um, lots of time we see these Patients being referred as, you know, the entire panel being done, the tuberculin skin test, the uh, IGRA test, and, you know, CT, X-ray chest. So I kind of want to make it a good guideline for the attendees how to go about testing for these patients. Because, you know, Quantiferon or the IGRA essays are costs, I mean, they're costly. It's not everybody's cup of tea when it comes to the patient profile. So. Um, like what I do is, then I take up. I'll I'll invite all panelists to give their opinion. So for me, the first test is the tuberculin skin test. I don't really go for the quantiferon test together with this tuberculin skin test in all the patients because if I have well-read tuberculin skin test, the result is available. I would not really depend upon the quantiferon test. So ordering simultaneously both the tests in every patient is not really required um, coming to the ct chest and the x-ray and there is a there is a connected question in the qa section which ct would you advise so the pulmonologists always prefer a contrast enhanced ct scan and from our own experience we've found that you know ct is far far informative than the chest x-rays and again to answer somebody asked there was a question that you know when we say most of these patients do not have systemic TB, why are we doing CT chest? 
So the simple reason, as also answered by Dr. Vishali, is that we are looking at the old infections. It's not the active infection, which is, you know, so we are looking at an old infection, which gives us that, yes, the patient has had TB. And not only that, I would like to add that, you know, there may be an active infection on CT scan. The patient is not symptomatic. So it's not that we are, the patient has to be symptomatic when it's an active infection in the chest or abdomen or anywhere in the lymph nodes. So patient is not symptomatic, but we are picking up just because the patient is coming to us with tubercular uveitis and we are picking them up. So we've picked up patients of abdominal tuberculosis also by doing these scans and, you know, patients are not symptomatic. So um, how do you um, open to panelists about the quantiferon, chest x-ray, CT and the tubercular skin test? Uh, Dr. Kempen, Dr. we'll start with you. We, um, so I'm practicing in Ethiopia. Um, IGRA has recently become available, but it's rare that a patient is keen to um, pay for that. So we rely mostly on PPD, which even that we have to make special arrangements to import, which maybe I'll need to talk to you about in our upcoming um, visit at USI. But um, we rely almost all on PPD. And if we have a case that we think it really should be tuberculosis, but it's been negative, say, twice on PPD, we might consider getting EGRA. Um, but, you know, from a Bayesian perspective, it's not too likely it should be TB if it has um, negative PPD twice. So I'm not sure if we're really right in doing that. And it only comes up rarely. We're not, we don't have any facility to do um, any sort of um, intraocular test. Um, they have a gene expert um, system on the um, sputum that's part of the vertical TB program that um, covers this country very well. Um, but it seems very rare that we would find that in an ocular TB case, again, maybe because it's more of a posse bacillary phenomenon um, that's causing the eye disease. So, um, Dr. Kempen, you would you like to comment, please? Yeah, so, you know, my take on this will be looking at the pretest probability, okay? And that is one factor. The other factor is the awareness that up to 30% of extra pulmonary TB can have negative tests. So if you combine these together, you know, I will first look at the clinical phenotype that we have at hand. Now, if I have a non-granulomatous antiviatis or a VKH like picture, I will not even test for TB in those patients, like Dr. Vishali mentioned earlier. But suppose in sitting in India, I have a patient with serpiginous like choroiditis or a particular phenotype of retinal vasculitis, occlusive venous involvement with the subvascular lesions. You know, these are the cases where I do not want to miss out on the diagnosis of tuberculosis. These are the key, and I, you know, the way our practice is, we cannot keep calling the patient again and again for follow up as well. So, for these reasons, I would want to test all of these together. Of course, the patient has to be affording for that as well, and we do keep that in mind. But given a choice, I would want to test all of these together so that even if one of these two comes negative, say the Montu is negative, I have a positive QTB with me. Or if the QTB is negative, I have a positive MONTU with me. Because I, I do not want to delay the start of anti-TB therapy in these patients. We saw in one of Sudarshan's cases how treating with steroids alone in these kind of patients can have disastrous consequences. So I don't want to have that, which is why I'll do all these tests together so that at least I have some evidence to get started with ATT as quickly as possible. So. Yeah, Sudarshan. Sudarshan, we cannot hear you. One of the questions in the Q&A was also that uh, why, we're, why we had treated the patient with ATT despite MAN2 and Quantiferin being negative. So in these situations, probably I, I value the recurrence as a weightage. So if you have a phenotype which is subgenous like, and then if you still, if you get one of these positive, then it's fine. But uh, if you don't get it, at least in that case, the HRCT was showing some old uh, Cox like lesions. So, when at least uh, among the three, if one of that is positive and if it is phenotypically uh, suggestive, then probably I go ahead with ATT. 
okay so thank you everyone thank you very much thank you to all the panelists for these wonderful uh, and, uh, brainstorming questions and uh, session some of the questions will still remain unanswered you know and uh, with this uh, we would like to uh, thank all the attendees for um, you know showing your interest and learn learning from the experts and great presentations by the fellows and the speakers so before we uh, conclude three announcements i would like to make one is about the inflammatio 2024 as dr vishali invited you by iosg on 20 20th and 21st november at singapore second is as dr sudarshan invited you and we also have the joint secretary of usi uid society of india in the panel so all the more makes it important and we have the chairperson of this uh, conference in the panel here so all the more we are keen to have all of you in the uid society of india more important is because it is the silver jubilee of this meeting on 4th to 6th october at chandigarh pgi and uh, the third is about the uh, next webinar the eighth webinar of iusg grand rounds which is an ocular syphilis next month on 12th of october so we again look forward to having all of you and till then goodbye good evening and thank you very much bye thank you very much thank you thank you everyone bye 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 thank you, bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.